We're very, very pleased to have with us Mark Hamilton, who's the Director of Technology for Sun Microsystems for Worldwide Education and Research. He's going to talk to us today about software development. He's written a book on software development, and he's been a systems engineer for many years. I'm glad that we have the opportunity to have somebody to give us the practical side of things. We've had a lot of different aspects, and please welcome Mark Hamilton. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I promised to talk about my book today, and so um, I will. But I'm going to change it a, a little bit from what we originally um, talked about. So my book talks really about, um, says that software development really focuses on, on three different things. It focuses on you know, having the right people, the right processes, and the right technology. So, um, and then finally, in chapter 23, it talks about, it says, a, a sneak peek at Genie technology. So the book was published in early 99, and so that was sort of, a, at the time, just an emerging technology. It's been a little bit better uh, defined now. So the title of this talk is Networks of Things, Changing the Rules. And so as you go out there and, and you get jobs in industry, you really do have the opportunity to go out there and think about you know what is software develop? What is software going to be like, and how is software going to work three, four, five, ten years from now? And one of the things uh, that hopefully this talk inspires you to do is really think about how software can be developed differently, and how some of the, the technologies that are embedded in Genie can be uh, applied to that. So, but back to the you know, people, process, and, and technology. When you apply for a job at a company, which is what we were talking about before, is it may be hard, you may have to talk to them a lot of times, but they're really doing the same thing. They're being very, very selective in who they select into the organization. And just like, hopefully you've all seen value in the selection process here and having a great group of peers to, to work to, if a company is too easy to get hired at, you might want to think, what's their selection process? And they're going to let other people in there. The process part. The process part is, is really, really important. And that's when, you know, it's what I talked about earlier today when I said that as you apply more people to a project, the, really the communication issues just increase. And you really need to, you know, have processes structured around that. And so that's what... Um, we find the, the downfallings of a lot of, specifically in the web environment, are of a lot of the new startups is they get two or three people together and they throw together some code and they're really smart people so the code runs really well and they have their website up and running. And now they start going to adding func functions or features to that website and they hire more programmers and those programmers don't know the code that was there before. So they maybe write the code and the interfaces aren't defined very well or the requirements aren't defined very well. And all of a sudden, the website goes down. And now they have 10,000 or 50,000 lines of code and they can't figure out where it broke, right? They say, all I did was change one little line of code and the whole thing uh, started, stopped working. So that's why you really need the processes. And I think when you go out there and, and get a job in industry, um, again, if I mean, a lot of, of people in industry that understand, you know, what the processes are to, to define requirements, to collect requirements, to, to have design reviews, to do those sorts of things. But all that being said, as I look forward to the future and as people at Sun do, we think, what's going to be the next big thing in computers? Sun is always looking and trying to reinvent itself and say, what's going to be, you know, the, the next uh, big market? Java, the internet, certainly a big market in, in, the, late, um, in the late 90s, and, and what's the, the next big thing? In order to move to the next level of, of simplicity, we really have to, to change the rules, and we need to think of, of really everything as a service and start thinking of not only as hardware devices as services that they offer, a disk storage service, a printing service, um, a video service to, vi to video something like this class, but start thinking of what does it mean as software as a service? So we live in real interesting times. That's really hard um, to dispute. Um, 
every time you pick up something, it always uh, a technical paper it talks about how the internet is growing. It's every six seconds a new you know website is added uh, to the internet, or someone else gets um, connected. Uh, embedded networks proliferate. What's an embedded network? You know, if you have a pocket PC, if you have a cell phone, that's an embedded network. You know, over the last five years, everyone connects now from home. They'll dial in through an, an ISP. And, and as I mentioned during the break, in Japan, more people connect to the internet via cell phones than they do over traditional devices. Um, so more and more things are being uh, connected. And so if you um, if you read a lot of the journals, they'll say there's actually there's a refrigerator you can buy out there now that has a you know web top panel built in. Um, you know, Bill Joy talks about you know walking walking down the street with his you know cell phone and you know getting it to ring and have a coupon pop up and say oh you know here's a dollar off for the Starbucks that's on the corner. I don't know how many times I've been driving home and, uh, from work, and I'll typically talk, call my wife and say, oh, hi, honey, driving home from, uh, from work, is there anything you need? Now, I'm here today on Valentine's Day, so you know I'm in trouble today. I, I was saying when I volunteered to do the talk today, I didn't realize. My wife always said, why do you wait till the last minute? And didn't realize it was Valentine's Day. But nevertheless, so I'll say, you know, you want me to pick up anything on the store, because I drive by the store, and she'll say, you know, no, we're fine. And you know, sometimes I stop at the store anyhow for something. And I'll get home and she says, oh, you know what? We needed milk. Can you go out and get milk? So if my cell phone could tell me that the refrigerator was out of milk, that might be really useful to me. So I know all of you have sort of been living, you know, separated lives where you're really focused heads down on, you know, your schooling. But there's some interesting um, things here that, that could happen. Well, this is real timely in California. Talked about lots of you know brand ups. Surprisingly, the the you know the biggest the peak usages of power are between like seven and you know seven to ten in the morning and five to seven at night. You know my first thoughts were that it'd be like midday. You know the power companies, you know can save billions of dollars by just shifting the load versus building new power plants. If you're at all concerned about the environment, I mean that's certainly you know a big issue. Um, medical monitoring. Or more and more medical devices now you want to be able to monitor. Now today there are devices that you know will take your blood pressure and hook up to a phone line and will dial in and you know report your blood pressure to a doctor and it'll go on you know get logged on your web page and you can review it. But there are still I mean they're a little bit difficult to use, right? They work for you know a small number of people that either really really have the need for that device or to take the time to go to the web page, re register, get the right plug-in for their browser, and make sure everything you know, works correctly. In the automotive phase, um, I used to work with Lexus. And even a couple years ago, they were thinking, you know, they, Lexus differentiates themselves. All the high-end auto companies is based on the whole level of service that they provide. So they want to be able to you know, call you up and say, you know, Mr. Hamilton, you know, We've seen from your public schedule that you're in the office today on Sepulveda Boulevard, and the last time you needed an oil change, you know, we picked up your car there and left you off, you know, a loaner and brought your car back before five. And is that still convenient for us to do tomorrow? So, you know, they'd like to do that remotely. Um, precision ag agriculture, you know, knowing, you know, where and, and when to plant, how much to water, particular. You know, device. Luckily, you know, Southern California has been pretty lucky in that we've been isolated from a lot of the um, power spikes and brownouts in Northern California because of William Mulholland, who built not only uh, the Mulholland Tunnel, but built a, a lot of the aqueducts and power lines going into Southern California. You know, can't you let the machines talk to each other? And you know, so you need to spend more time, you know, talking to your customers. And of course, I spend all day talking to my customers, which is why I'm reading email at night. Um, Today, you know, people think, well, if you have, you know, if you're on the, the desktop, you say, well, Windows, as long as you have Windows, that's the one. Does your Motorola cell phone run the same, you know, OS as my Ericsson cell phone? Does the Palm 7 run the same, you know, operating system, the same software as the HP Pocket PC? No. We're really seeing more of a proliferation of devices, not more and more standardization. And the idea that really explicit administration doesn't scale. 
right? If you go through and if I'm um, administering a, a local area network, right, in most companies, I might have one administrator for, you know, one or 200 users. And that works fine in, in a corporation, in a school, when you have, you know, hundreds, thousands, maybe 10 or 20,000 users. But now you read, you know, anyone out, you know, any of the literature out there says that, you know, in this decade, there will be billions and billions of devices. You know, the average Mercedes-Benz car today has 12 microprocessors in it, you know. You know, every car could have multiple IP addresses, right? You know, one for the cell phone, one for the engine. Different. How do you administer all that? Um, as much as it'd be great for anyone who's you know studying computer science to go out there and say, you know, it could be a you know system administrator, you know, work forever. It's not going to scale. It could take anyone who's ever had a, a, a computer science degree and turn them into a system administrator. And the model today, as far as scalability, you know, doesn't scale. So. And again, the idea of it, explicit things need to figure out. You know, one machine needs to figure out how to talk to another machine automatically. And how do we get there on a large scale? If you're a, if you're a believe in, in chaos theory, you know, people say evolution has to be chaotic. It can't be a, you know, it has to be revolutionary versus evolutionary. So a couple things that, you know, a couple implications here. One is software can't be specialized. Right, if I write something that only works on uh, an Intel platform or something that only works on a Spark platform, it's not going to scale. Uh, configurations aren't static, right? You can't, how many people have ever rebooted their cell phone, right? It's just not, you know, you can't just stop, you can't stop and reboot your car, right? You don't want the anti lock brake system to, to reboot as you're driving down the street on a rainy day. Um, and everyone shares everything. The idea that I'm doing my taxes on the Quicken or the, or the, uh, the TurboTax website is I don't want it, you know, and if I wait till the last day to do it, is I don't want their server to go down on April 15th. So what are some of the, the rules, you know, governing the industry? One is, I'm sure you've studied Moore's Law, and this is pretty much, at least for the next 10, probably 15 years, will still hold true as we talk to chip technologists, saying every 18 months technology will, or every 18 months the tech processing power will double. George Gilder has written a lot in, in industry about networks and the evolution of networks. And really what he says is that bandwidth doubles every 12 months. <laughs> So, and this is really a fairly recent curve from 1982, from when we shipped the first Sun One workstation, until 1995, Sun shipped 10 megabit Ethernet. So, for you know, 13 years, networking basically stayed the same. 1995, we introduced fast Ethernet, so we went up by a factor of 10 in 95. Um, this year, we introduced gigabit Ethernet, so it only took you know, five years to go from, you know, from um, 100 megabit to gigabit Ethernet. And it's going to be less than five years before we get 10 gigabit Ethernet built in on every server that you buy. So what that really means is now bandwidth, which before was your, was your originally was CPU power is limiting, right? It was, you know, I had my 100 megahertz Pentium and I could only do so much on that. Today, you know, you can go off and buy, you know, anywhere between 800 to, you know, 1.5 gigahertz Pentium, and they probably all have more than enough processing power for anything that you or I are, are going to do, with some very few exceptions. And so, but that, and so a few years ago, we said, well, dial-up modems. That was the access point. Two years ago, I had my 500 megahertz Pentium and my my 56K modem, and you know I wasn't happy because I couldn't download that video stream in real time. Today I've got a cable modem. You can get DSL. You can get high-speed bandwidth, you know, to your home, you know, to your office delivered for you know 20, 30, 35 dollars a month. So that really isn't the limitation anymore. What uh, Feynman's prediction says, he says applications will always be uh, will be parallel and distributed. So. Um, Interesting note, uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, Juno Networks, which is one of the free ISPs, um, and the traditional free ISP model says, I'm going to go through and you know, give you advertising on your screen, and I'll give you free ISP services. Well, so Juno has said, 
I'm not only going to give you free advertising, but you know, when you're not on your computer, I'm going to take over your computer cycle. So they're going to turn all their users into you know, what they think will be the world's largest distributed um, supercomputer. Uh, again, there's certain classes of applications that are well suited to that sort of model, and there's certain ones that aren't. But nevertheless, there's a lot of research today is going in to doing distributed applications. As you think about what is the software that you know you're going to develop, you know today, tomorrow, for five, ten years from now, you have to think of the concept of distributed and widely distributed applications. So now. How do we become chaotic and evolve to this or through a revolution versus a slow evolution? You know, the next generation of Solaris, the next generation of whatever your favorite um, operating system is. So we, um, and really that means that the old assumptions don't hold. Um, we really need to have you know, new science out there in distributed computing. Uh, a lot of it is being done today, but a lot of it is still some of the big unsolved problems. And a lot of a lot of companies doing research in, and a lot of, of educational institutions doing research in is how do you take advantage of using all these distributed devices and ultimately to bring you know computing power down to more uh, the masses. It needs to be simplified. There's today the the, the PC penetration rate in the U.S. is about 67 percent was the last number I saw. And depending on who you listen to, it varies. But pretty much, you know, with some exceptions, is everyone who really wants to have a PC in their home has purchased a PC and, and has a PC already. So the next the sort of the next wave of evolution or revolution will be when you know it gets simplified. It's when the internet becomes as easy to use as your TV. Is that's when the next, you know, the 99% the of the people that have TVs will be able to use it. Today, you can buy PCs for the same price point as TVs. So that's not to say that there aren't people out there that can't afford PCs. There certainly are, but um, a large number of people. Certainly, the difference between 67% of people have PCs and 90%, 99% of people have TVs. Is they just don't want to be bothered with or don't know have the skills required to use a, a computer connected to the internet. So what are the assumptions? I mean, most a lot of people out there in industry today building software make some assumptions. Um, they say that I'm going to have small, meaning relatively small, tens of thousands of nodes in my network. And adding or taking out nodes is rare. Um, but we assume the network is reliable, right? That's the web tone I was talking about. The network's going to be as reliable as the telephone system. Well, in reality, especially once you move into mobile devices, that's not true. Either sometimes the network is unreliable or the network itself is reliable, but when you go you know, through the Logan Tunnel, your cell phone doesn't always work. Right? There's inherent characteristics there that make it unreliable. And for the most part today, if you look at, again, at least if you look at a desktop, there's fairly small variations you know, within an order of magnitude in, in power and in latency. So you know, I know when Microsoft goes off and releases, you know, their next release of Windows, they say, you know, this is going to work on a, you know, 200 megahertz plus Pentium. You know, you have that sort of variation in there from 200 megahertz to, you know, 2000 or whatever it would be at the time. But again, you don't have, you know, you can't run Windows on a cell phone. And actually, latency, that's sort of an interesting example. Latency is much, much lower. Right. On Windows, if you move the mouse and sometimes it takes five seconds to move from one window to another, that's totally acceptable on your gigahertz you know, Pentium. You may be a little bit upset, but you know, you, you'll wait. You've got you know, 50 megahertz you know, microprocessor running your analog brake system, but if you step on the brakes and it takes you skid for five seconds, that's totally unacceptable. Hardware, like we said, pretty much homogeneous in the desktop space. We sort of assume that the operating system is going to have virtual memory, whether it's a Macintosh or Windows or uh, Solaris. We're multi-process machines. The CPU in, a, in a, a digital camera is not running multiple processes at one time. It's running one process, the, the digital camera control process. And you've got consistent processing power and consistent network bandwidth. Again, the idea of you know, one of the big research areas is saying, you know, I've got a laptop. You know, how do I make sure, how do I get consistent, you know, how do I run my application on a laptop when I'm you know, 
its school connected to a 100 megabit or gigabit network versus how does that change when you know I go off into the campus and maybe connected via an 11 megabit wireless versus when I get in my car and drive home and maybe I'm connected via you know a couple tens of, uh, of kilobits per second over my cell phone. So a lot of you know the changes there need to be not only in the applications but in the underlying protocols. The protocols need to be aware of what environment you're operating in. Um, Again, on assumptions, we've got humans in the loop, right? Personal computer, you've got a person there to hit Control Alt Delete. You've got a person there to type in the characters. And as much as Sun has tried with Java, we still have different programming languages out there, and still people coming up with um, new ones. So what are the results? We have language-independent systems, right? Sometimes by design, sometimes there's certain you know, business advantages to lock someone in to a particular architecture. Sometimes, how do you deal with network failures? In most applications today, it's either ignored or it's treated as a fatal event. Um, and finally, nodes are assumed to stay put, again, in, in, in a certain sense. Um, a little bit in the, in the cellular network, you can take a cell phone and move it around different parts of the world, still get you know, your email to your, your cell phone. But a typical PC isn't meant to move. Again, a laptops are a little bit, things like DHCP, but those really require a lot of administration to set up and aren't universally global in um, their applicability. And finally, here's a big one that you know Juno ran into. Is you know someone said, well, you know, what if you turn on their PC? What if you turn off your PC? And so actually, it was pointed out in, in the article I read. It, if you read the fine print of the new, you know, they posted their acceptable use policy or their you know use policy to get the free ISP, and it says you have to leave your computer on and running 24 hours a day, which sometimes in California, you know, you can't even if you wanted to. Now, do I have to buy a, a UPS? So. How might you develop code today? If, you know, you probably studied something like this, and you know, there's something called interface definition language, and if you're working on a big project with other programmers. You might go and take your little piece of, you know, the software project, the service, define an interface definition language that says how other programmers can call your software. Um, you'll run it through often an IDL compiler for Java or for C. There are different ones for different languages. You generate some source code. That source code is then compiled often to a platform-specific environment. Again, Java would typically not would be platform neutral, but C, C++, other languages are platform-specific. And then you have your distributed objects. This is really hard to do. I mean, if you go out there and say, if I were to say, if I looked at all the C programmers that were in industry, there were probably less than 10% know how to build a good distributed application using this sort of architecture. It's really hard to do. Not a lot of people can do it. If you can know how to do it, you have a good market, good job market for the next couple of years at least to go off and do that. So what's the price? Complexity, multiple compilers, fragility. A little bit, you know, again, with object-oriented programming, the idea of defining a service or an interface versus the implementation or how that specific function gets done is there. You need to update stuff, right? Today, if I want to roll out an application, it's very, very tedious. Now, you can do some of this, again, on web-based applications, but even that today, you have concerns about was you know, was my Java applet cached somewhere in the network? And, you know, what happens if that's not, you know, refreshed? I need to put checks in. So, objects to the rescue, a little bit, right? You studied, have you studied object-oriented programming? So you say there are a lot of things that, you know, objects buy you, but it's really not, you know, the final answer because you still have the final complexity on the delivery. So with language-dependent distribution, this is some of what Java buys you. So Java gives you the portable code, gives you the dynamic loading, gives you the code verification, and it gives you polymorphism. Um, anyone happen to know what Java, the original application that Java was written for? And it wasn't for the internet. So the, the original... Uh, yeah. We actually yeah. did talk about this. It was, <laughs> <laughs> it was programming appliances. That was weeks ago. It was programming appliances. Well, 
It was, pr- it was, it was developed to, or the original um, genesis behind Java was, um, was in the early 90s, if you remember. Everyone was talking about digital cable and that you would have 500 channels of, of TV on your cable. Now, I still only have 50-odd channels, not 500. But, but nevertheless, Scott said, he goes, he goes, you know what? He goes, my mom's VCR is always flashing 12, 12, 12, and she can't figure out how to, you know, use the remote control today. So he goes, I want you to write, you know, a language that lets my mom program this remote control. You know, it's got to be easy to use, you know, four-inch screen. So it's actually been, was demoed, um, it, uh, James Gosling showed it at, at at least one of the Java 1 conferences, but they built a device called the Star 7, which was a sort of, you know, Palm 7 sized remote control and that was actually the test. They really did bring in Scott's mom and she was able to, you know, program her, her VCR with this device using little applets that were downloaded over this TV network and then sort of the whole, you know, video on demand, 500 channels of, of video sort of didn't catch on in, in the mid 90s and the internet did so we sort of shifted the gears of Java for that but lest I, I diverge we eventually do get back to um, to video programming too, and, and a lot of these properties are very useful. So the original Genie Vision was sort of based on a, a couple of facts. One, it was that you wouldn't necessarily have personal computers. Now, that's not to say that all the personal computers you have are going to go away, but people who want personal computers have them for the most sake and know how to use them. Everything's going to be shared, and you're going to have cheap components, right? The idea of you can take a um, even you can take a processor and, and, and you can build a you know low-end processor for a couple of dollars and embed it in a device. Certainly a you know 50, 100 megahertz cheap embedded device. Um, the uh, the Furbies have a micro, have a very small microprocessor in them, and those sold for you know 10, 15 dollars. Right? And they had that uh, microcontroller in them. <clears throat> And really was, again, going back to crossing the divide between consumer devices and computer devices. It doesn't do any good for my toaster or for my washing machine to have a computer in it if it's as hard to program as my PC, because that means the only people I'll take advantage of that are the people that today program PCs. Um, and we really wanted to change software assembly. Some of these were based on ideas that were proposed in Java and proposed in object-oriented programming, but really taking it to the next level, saying I'm not only going to view, again, hardware as a service, but any software I'm going to view as a service. And now you start thinking if you view software as a service or hardware and it's networked together, how do those services get to know about other services? How do clients learn about services and how do clients consume services? And that was the idea behind Genie. So the core concept started with applets. Applets gave you the ability to have mobile code. Uh, There was then remote method invocation. Again, part of the idea of if I have a, you know, if I have my address list in my cell phone and I walk into a room that has a printer in it, I would like to print it to that printer. I really don't want to, you know, load a specific Ericsson compatible sync software on your PC and then load, you know, somehow get some, you know, HP printer driver that works for my cell phone and sync it all up and, and, and get it to work. I want it to just be automatic. So what do you need for that? You need besides the concept of objects, you need you need a directory, you need in effect discovery and lookup services. So let's look and see how those work. The first thing um, is service registration. So let's say um, I have a printer, and that printer is going to offer up a service. Now, again, the idea is is not to say every printer out there needs to be rewritten or the device drivers for every printer needs to be rewritten. But it's saying every printer, in effect, offers a service, and that service has some attributes. It prints a certain number of pages per minute. It can maybe du- print duplex. So in a Genie network, you have a lookup service, which is basically the directory that runs on the network. And when a service, let's say it's a hardware service like printing, comes in and registers on that network, it has a little piece of genie code in it. The rest of it could be coded in you know, any language you want. And it's called the service project proxy object. 
typically this would be handled by a service running on maybe the PC in your home or, or some server in your office. And it would respond back and it would say, oh, you know, I am the lookup service and I'm running on this particular port using this protocol. Today we would assume TCP IP, but again, think of the cell phone world, think of, you know, Bluetooth for, you know, local device access. It could be over any particular protocol. It, what the Genie service then does is take that little piece of Java code or Genie code, which is written in Java, that describes the attributes of that printer and it sends it off to the lookup service. So. One idea is saying, you know, I now looking at it from a hardware view and hardware services registering. So think if I am a service to, you know, we we're talking earlier about e-learning. What would be a service you'd want for e-learning? Well, you'd want to be able to do video streaming. So if I'm a video streaming service, which could be a software service, I could broadcast out and say, you know, I can stream certain types of video and here's, you know, how you, here's how you look up the actual contents that I have. The next thing that happens is I come in with my Genie client. So this might be my Genie client. So on the printer side, it would say, well, you know, is there, the first thing I do is I do the same thing that the service did, is I say, is there a lookup service out there? So it would then go in, it would broadcast out, maybe over wireless, and say, is there any lookup service out there? So there'd be some smart wireless device, maybe hooked up on a PC or a server that would respond back, say, aha, I'm out here, I am the lookup service. In fact, if you don't have a lookup service, part of Genie includes sort of peer-to-peer -peer communication that this could talk directly to, you know, a Genie-enabled, you know, advanced printer that would have the lookup service built in to the actual printer device itself. But that's really just a separate implementation of uh, the service model. The next thing I would do is I would say I want to look up a service. Again, think of non-hardware-based services. I might broadcast out and say, you know, is there any service out there that's a directory service that can tell me what pizza restaurants deliver pepperoni and anchovy pizza, you know, here? So different things, services can not only be hardware services, they could be various software services. You know, I might say, you know, one of the, it was in this cell phone, my last cell phone, it, you know, it didn't sort, you know, it only sort my, you know, phone list by the by the ID by the entry in my phone list one to hundred. You know, one of the things I like is to sort my phone list alphabetically. So I know I want to look up, you know, Hamilton. I can just scroll down to where H's are. Well, you might have a sort service that sits out there on the network, and it would take in a you know one linked list of entries, and it would return back another linked list, which is the sorted by you know whatever attribute it's sorted by linked list. So start thinking now about software as a service. So at this point, I have my cell phone, and it has a handle to the particular service. So it's my client. And really, all that's downloaded, once I get this little blue code is what I got from the lookup service. And this basically tells me how to talk to the service. It then goes in and will talk to the actual Genie service which again, may not be written in, um, in Java other than for that little lookup handle. So at this point now, the client goes off, talks directly to the service. Um, when you think about this is what are some of the things that this enables and what are some of the concepts that are really built in to the core architecture of it? Well, it's really designed for things like cell phones, things that come and go. Think even of printers. Think at a big, you know, university with, you know, 50,000, 35,000 students. How many printers do they have? Or think of a business. How many printers are there at Sun? And how many, you know, how many times a day does a printer go offline, like offline get, you know, recycled, thrown in the trash, or does a new printer come online? We probably have, you know, we probably have more than one full-time equivalent system administrator at Sun that all he or she does is add printers and remove printers, if you were to look at all the people that added or, or removed printers to the network. So there's a lot of overhead, and that, that scales for Sun because we can hire a lot of system administrators, but it doesn't scale when you have billions of devices. What if you said you want to let every cell phone in the world talk to every printer in the world? And those printers come in all on, online and offline, and the cell phones come online and offline. If you were to do that manually, it wouldn't work. 
You need to have something like like Genie to enable that to work. So again, some of the things that, that we, we talked about here that are really important, saying the protocols don't matter. You know, whether I'm talking TCP IP or RMI or via some infrared or, or wireless interface, all the client needs to know is the interface. You just need to know what that service is. Communication then is, is a private matter between the service consumer and the service provider. And again, everything's a service. Software is a service, hardware is a service. And really, when you step back and, and think about that, that's sort of, I think, the big change in thinking. It may not use Genie you know, up front. It may not even use Java up front. But as you're going off and designing that project, think ahead you know, one, two, five years. Think of you know, who are all the possible people, not even people, think of all the possible devices that might use that software at some point in the future and start thinking about writing that software as a service. And finding is, you know, is a service is not based on the name. I don't need to know that, you know, I want to print to, you know, laser printer HP underscore 17Z, you know, or whatever the naming convention is, right? It, um, what you want to know is, you know, print to any, you know, black and white printer that can handle 640 by, you know, 800 resolution. So again, with Java, you already, Java already knows how to call out to legacy devices and to call out from legacy software into Java. So that part is sort of handled in, um, by Genie already. It doesn't have to exist beforehand in devices. I don't have to go through and you know, pre-program devices ahead of time to understand Genie. So again, where does the Java code exist? It's a service proxy object. That's where the Java code is. Again, uh, the actual implementation today of all the Genie classes is about um, is about 14,000 lines of Java code that sits on additional Java classes um, that sits on top of the base language. So, um, it's just the beginning. I think that's what makes you know Genie interesting. If you know if there was a complete solution and the problem was you know solved is then you, know, you wouldn't get jobs being paid the big bucks to figure out how to make it all work. I mean, you can get Java, you know, a Java-enabled pager today, but it's not quite, you know, it's not going to run you know, your home banking applet that you run on um, your PC. Uh, security is a big issue, right? How do, you, you know, if I, how do you authenticate users that are coming and going? How do you authenticate services that are coming and going? Um, Bandwidth, power conservation, versioning. <coughs> versioning is, is, is one of the big you know, issues with Genie that remains to be solved is when you know, I have you know, a new version of a particular service. How do I make sure that you know, that gets redistributed, the caches are flushed, that you have the right protocol going on? Again, as you think of programming, as you think of computer science, it's really no longer just for, the, for servers and desktops. Right? I don't want... You know, I don't want every time I walk into a room and I want to print, I don't want to call up the system administrator and say, can you add, you know, the phone number of my IP-enabled phone to your, you know, printer so that I can print to it. You need to have, you know, some sort of mechanism to do that. Um, administration has to be automatic. And finally, things have, when you think about that, things have to change in an, in an uncoordinated way. So... That's, uh, that's some thoughts to think about software development, to think about where you know, software development is going and some of the things that, uh, that you might go off and work on. So are there other people that sound that think this is the way the world is going? Um, a couple of different things. Sometimes some of them are positioned as competing technologies and, and, and really aren't. The, the biggest, um, the one that I think has the most momentum is um, Bluetooth technology. So Bluetooth is the, um, the short, dis short distance local proximity, like within 20 feet, you know, networking technology. So Ericsson actually sells a Bluetooth adapter for this, and the idea being then that you know, this could go through and talk, to, you know, talk directly to a, a Bluetooth-enabled printer. Um, now, that's probably more of a... Um, it's not really a competing technology because if you think about it, what Bluetooth is 
um, what Bluetooth is doing is, is addressing the underlying communication protocol. So it's the infrared protocol between the different devices. What you still need on top of Bluetooth is you still need some mechanism there so that, you know, I've, okay, I've got Bluetooth on my cell phone, I've got Bluetooth on my printer, so what? How does my printer know how to talk to my cell phone? So some of the real early, you know, Bluetooth implementations have sort of defined some standard service models that do, you know, small subsets of what you could do with Genie, but they're not really general purpose per se. Um, personally, I think Bluetooth is a great technology, is a great enabling technology to enable sort of, you know, infrared wireless access to devices. It's exactly why you want something like Genie running on top of Bluetooth. And there's actually a lot of work at, through, not as much at Sun, but through, you know, Sun technology partners like Ericsson, like Sony, to come out with Genie implementations on top of Bluetooth. Um, the, the one that's really probably more positioned in industries of competing technology is something that Microsoft calls universal plug and play. So, of course, everyone's sort of familiar with plug and play, meaning that says you plug in the printer to your PC, and as long as you know, the Microsoft CD has a device driver for that printer, it automatically starts working. And that sort of addresses the, the underlying, you know, hardware to hardware technology. And so what universal plug and play tries to sort of take that to the next level and layer some software on top of that. I think the, the big difference and ultimately what will drive the, the success of, of one or both standards is, is universal plug and play really comes at everything from a PC centric um, direction. It assumes that you have a Microsoft or it requires that you have a Microsoft Windows operating system on the network to be the universal plug and play server. So when I want my you know, Ericsson cell phone to talk to a HP printer, it works as long as there's a Windows you know, NT or Windows you know, workstation on the network. Um, Genie doesn't require any particular type of server technology. Like I said, it includes the concept of having the lookup service built into the actual devices or having any sort of device on, on the network. And, and ultimately, um, as much as I respect Microsoft for having you know, dominated markets and to be able to change the direction and move in into other markets such as the web browser space, it, it's difficult to think that you know, a single company is going to control you know, every interface and every one of the billions of devices out there that run uh, microprocessors and have a network port on it. Microsoft.net, I didn't mention anything about that. No, I certainly can. Uh, everyone's into three-letter acronyms these days. So what, what Microsoft uh, announced a, a couple months ago was Microsoft.net. And Microsoft has had, you know, ever since we came out with, with Java, they've had a lot of, um, they've had a, a lot of different names to the, their technology. And, and originally all of Microsoft's and this is my take on it as best as I can understand their changing roadmap. But they had COM, which is the, their common object model, which is sort of the basis for Microsoft uh, pro object-oriented programming. And then when the Internet came around, they sort of changed that to DCOM and then ActiveX. Um, and so what ActiveX or DCOM does is it takes that common object model and extends it to work over a network, much like Java would do. And really, Microsoft.net is really an, um, um, I'll call it a marketing umbrella that really covers, you know, the DCOM, COM, ActiveX technology. And furthermore, make some additions to that. And the idea being that, you know, all its underlying technology is that, for instance, when I go to a, you know, website and I say, you know, I want to buy flowers, and then I go to the plant, and then it go, or I want to buy plant, you know, flower, rose plants to plant, and then you go to, it would automatically link you to another website that maybe sells 
potting soil and it would pass, you know, what type of roses you bought to the gardening website that would let you fit, recommend, you know, here's the best type of soil that you use for these roses. And by the way, we know your credit card number already and your address and we'll just uh, ship it to you and charge your credit card. And, and that's all nice. And actually, Microsoft is, has said that they're going to um, you know, that he said, well, this will work best if you have a Windows system in it, but we'll eventually support non-Windows based platforms. So um, a lot of what comes out of Microsoft is very good at setting forth a vision out there and then going off and worrying how to implement it. Um, Sun isn't always quite as good on, on the marketing side. Really, the, the sort of competing technology from Sun is Sun announced, which you probably never heard of, but we announced it a couple of weeks ago. It's called Sun One. You know, three-letter acronym, you know, ONE, which stands for Sun's Open Network Environment. And if you really look behind, you know, what is Sun's Open Network Environment, it's really the combination of, you know, our J2EE architecture, which is our Java 2 Enterprise Environment architecture, you know, bundled with our Forte development tools for doing development, bundling with a lot of the iPlanet services for delivering um, the technology for delivering those applications over the, over the web. So the concepts are similar. They're saying, you know, the value proposition of Sun One and of, of Microsoft.net is, you know, dear Mr. and Mrs. Developer, Mr. and Ms. Developer, is that's, you know, you're the audience for both of those. And, you know, we're going to make it easy for you to develop applications that run over the Internet. And again, time and time again, you know, it goes back to the same old, you know, where are the, the two companies coming from? You know, Microsoft is coming from a, you know, we sort of own the desktop world and we want to continue to expand that out to everywhere else and we're going to make this, you know, work best with, with desktops. And Sun continues to, to work in a, you know, we're going to help define standards and make this easy to do and then we're going to go off and compete on the implementation of those standards. So if you want to buy NFS from IBM, that's great. Go through and do that. And if you think that the Sun NFS implementation is better, buy it from Sun. But you know that the two are going to work together. And same with things like J2EE, which have been adopted by everyone but Microsoft you know, in, in the industry, saying, write your applications to J2EE and it's going to be you know, that open you know, back-end server architecture.